to this webinar and special thanks to the education committee of the pediatric section, Dr. Durham, Leonard and Limbrick for allowing us to put this on. This is a webinar coming to you from Johns Hopkins and Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia, a combined presentation. I'm going to moderate. I'm the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Hopkins. We've got an all-star panel and I can see we've got an all-star uh, participants as well. So we'll begin, uh, the title of this is uh, a skin covered spina bifida or uh, what's in a name, closed spinal dysraphism. And we're leading off with my partner, the immortal, one and only Dr. Eric Michael Jackson, who is the William Shakespeare of pediatric neurosurgery. And we'll let him share his screen. He'll give a, uh, a bit of an overview of this and then we'll open it up for some questions. And in the second half, we have three uh, shorter talks and time for more discussion. So without further ado, here he is, Mr. Shakespeare, Dr. Jackson. All right, uh, thanks, Al. As always, uh, you always outdo yourself. Um, you know, this talk, obviously there's a lot of people in, uh, I think in this that, that know a lot of this stuff. This is intended more for kind of the, the trainees, uh, but wanted to, to go through things a little bit, highlight some of the controversies and uh, open things up for discussion a little bit. Um, outline, we'll start by just defining spina bifida uh, based on the title. We'll discuss spina bifida occulta, talk about treatment, and then spina bifida occulta versus occult tethering. Um, no financial disclosure. They will start off when we get to the controversy. So when you're listening to the talk, you can understand my personal biases and where they're coming from. Um, I tend to treat um, obvious tethered cord in patients that are less than a year, and I do not tend to untether patients for symptoms in the absence of imaging findings. But we'll, we'll get into um, why those may be relevant. Um, so I think you know, when I first um, made a talk like this, one of the things that kind of jumped out at me was just even the confusion of the term spina bifida and how often um, people refer to spina bifida and, and just mean myelomeningocele, which I think as neurosurgeons, we understand, but a lot of times it gets into the lay public or even in other specialties and it, and it doesn't really make sense. Um, here's a teenage boy I saw who'd been adopted from Eastern Europe, who parents were told he had a myelomeningocele he was wheelchair bound and had lower extremity, no lower extremity function, but the remainder of his neuraxis was completely normal. So clearly he has an abnormality here, but I, I don't think it's, it's technically myelomeningocele. Um, you know, at Johns Hopkins, which is you know, supposed to kind of have specialty and everything, here's a report that I saw from, from one of the OB ultrasounds where they said there appears to be a closed spinal defect, likely a myelomeningocele. Um, so clearly there's some, some misunderstanding. And so getting back to the uh, Latin, um, bifida left in two parts. And so that's, but that's typically referring to the bony spine. Um, so spina bifida really only uh, is referring to the bone. And so the occulta, it's a closed defect because it's not obvious. And really we have a very broad range from significant neurological effects to simply fusing the failure of fusion of the posterior elements. Whereas a perda or myelomeningocele is the open defect and, and there's typically always neurological consequences or, or other findings. Um, you know, here's just a, a picture from online that kind of shows kind of from the normal to the, the simple occulta to meningocele and thing like, like myelomeningocele. Um, Clearly, this is a case that, that's fairly obvious, and it's myelomeningocele. We can see the, the neural elements. That's not really the, the goal of what we're, we're talking about today. Those patients are going to have a constellation of, of CNS abnormalities from the maldevelopment related to the open defect, um, contrasted with primary spinal problems with patients with closed defects. So with by, spina bifida occulta, and you know, from all the, the fetal literature we talk about with the open ones, why the, the brain abnormalities are secondary to the, to the spina bifida. Now, you know, we talk about how these patients don't necessarily need routine imaging of the brain or things like that. Um, now, a, a subset of the population can have primary brain abnormalities. So um, you know, if there's issues, those are things that, that can be looked at, but it's not secondary to the, the spine. It may be a gene that caused both. And obviously there's a full range of phenotypes from just the pure bony abnormality that, that needs really nothing 
um, to phylum abnormalities, dermal sinuses, down to the, the more significant things like the uh, split cord malformations and the myelocystoceles and lipomyelos. In terms of the occult spinal dysraphism, really, um, you know, as the neurosurgeon, our role is really for the tethering. I think uh, contrasting open, the, there's not really an increased risk, risk of infection with the exception of dermal sinuses, and those usually present in a delayed fashion with, inf with infection. Um, you know, in my practice, we typically treat these in delayed fashion, usually MRI when they're a little older. Nowadays, with all these feed and wrap protocols, you can tend to get it when they're an infant, um, but I think the imaging does definitely change and is better over time. Um, and then usually uh, I tend to do surgery in the six to 12 month range. Obviously, you know, stopping the, at areas of controversy, um, there's definitely controversy uh, of the need for surgery and timing of surgery. So I think th this is one we've had at our national meetings, the, the point counterpoint um, where there's discussion of the prophylactic untethering as an infant versus waiting. And so with clear untethering, with clear tethering, many people recommend prophylactic untethering as a baby with the, the thought that if symptoms develop, they may not improve. Um, and you're kind of stuck with the deficit that, um, that you may not have been stuck with. And it can be difficult to determine if a baby is symptomatic. Uh, there's another school that, um, you know, there's in Cochrane reviews and uh, things that talk about that a lot of these patients require redo untethering. So not, why not just wait until they're symptomatic? And so I think as, as you're going out into to practice, you have to figure out which, um, which side you fall on or, or someplace in between. Um, symptoms, again, in, in babies, it can sometimes be hard to see because, um, you know, I always talk about a baby, the exam is they eat, sleep, cry, pee, poop, and wiggle. Um, so it's a little bit hard to um, get, get down into some of these um, findings, but obviously they can have weakness, sensory loss, you're not going to pick up in a baby, or, or radicular pain, and abnormal gait obviously can be later. Um, we do sometimes see toe walking, foot deformities, or leg length discrepancies, scoliosis, and then obvi obviously urologic um, changes. Now, to, um, to get into things and, and identifiers for these patients, there are a lot of cutaneous lesions that we can see. Um, you know, obviously the hairy patch, and I think it, the hairy patch is one of those things that it tends not to be subtle. Um, if there's a little bit of hair on a baby, most of the time that's going to be normal. Um, these are typically profuse and it's typically more for, um, uh, the, the split cords we'll see. You can have appendages, dimples. Um, now there's a, a bunch of papers about, uh, this with the sacral dimple and the symmetric deviated clefts are low risk and probably don't need imaging. Um, you'll see a lot of that in, in, in practice and people getting studies or sending to you and, and these, these typically don't need anything. Obviously lipomas um, that you can see and then cloacal extrophy, I'm not going to get too much into because uh, uh, Dr. Judy, our resident, will talk about it, but that's uh, it's not a cutaneous lesion, but it's a fairly obvious finding if the, the abdomen is, is open. Um, so here's an example, a bunch of pictures from the ISPN guide, which is a great resource. Um, you know, here's a hairy patch, which is um, obvious. Um, you, know, you can have things like hemangiomas in, in the low back that stand out. Here's um, an appendage. This patient was transferred to us emergently or urgently for treatment of a myelomeningocele, and it was just a, a, a big skin tag. Um, dimples. Um, here's a, a patient of, of mine that you can see these dimples high up. And then here's another example from uh, Kurt Rizal. Um, typically, if it's above the gluteal cleft, those are the ones we worry about, whereas the ones that are lower down um, tend not to be. And there's, there's a good number of papers um, about those findings. Um, lipoma, you know, the large thing sticking up on the back. Now, in terms of um, imaging, and other dysraphisms, uh, abnormalities of the phylum. Here's, here's a classic example of um, you know, what we can see. The conus uh, should be close to the final position at birth. Um, you know, every once in a while in the NICU, we'll get an ultra preemie that it looks lower and we just say to kind of wait and see. 
But so L23, most papers suggest is the bottom limit of normal. Um, and so this patient, obviously, the cord is ending lower and there, there's fat in the phylum. Um, so then here's a patient with a dermal sinus, uh, five-month-old presented with this lumbar dimple. You can also see that the conus is, is abnormal appearing. Um, you know, in my experience, and I think most others I've talked to, you see the dimple tends to go down, the track tends to go down and then up and around. Here's an example um, intraoperatively. Um, to orient the top is, is up here, bottom is here. This one actually had two different tracks that were kind of piercing the dura. So you just kind of find that and, and follow it up and, um, and, and cut it. Uh, lipomyelomeningocele for my, um, this is getting into some cases that my friends from CHOP may, may recognize from about 20 years ago. Um, Here's a, a large fatty mass on the back. The, the MRI um, shows the fatty mass here. Um, I have to credit uh, Lee Sutton as these were actually his cases. I don't think Lee's given any talks anymore. So, um, and um, you know, you can, you have to find the, the mass, uh, you know, find the normal dura. It goes into the fat and you just have to, to kind of separate them out and, and, and make a, make a normal, normal dura. That's what it looks like. Um, dorsal lipomas, sep separate from like lipomyelos, where the nerve roots are coming out into the, into the back. The dorsal lipoma, it's just the fat connects in. And usually it kind of looks like a big sausage almost that you can just kind of separate out. Um, you can see the nerve roots and then the, the, the fat on top of it. Um, Myelocystocele is when the spinal cord ends into a cystic mass that tends to be in, in the soft tissue. Now, here's a good example of the distinction in the imaging. So this was a patient that the, the NICU had gotten an MRI around the time of birth. You know, in this way, you almost wonder whether it's a, a lipomyelo, whereas when the kid gets a little bit older, you see that it's actually a, a cystic structure. Um, one of the more impressive myelocystoceles, again, this was from uh, my time as a resident, and I think, you know, the one thing we always talk about, and this was the exception, um, usually you let these kids go home and treat them in a delayed fashion. Obviously, this child would have been difficult to, to take care of it at home with the cyst being um, half the size of the child. You can see here, it transilluminates that it's, it's really only, only fluid. And there weren't really much in the way of neural elements out there. You can see this child had actually been diagnosed prenatally and there was a small cyst in utero that clearly got a lot bigger by, by the time of birth. Um, here is uh, the opening, and there's actually just a small opening. And so a lot of the surgery was, was just closure um, and, and getting it back together. Uh, diastomatomyelia, I unfortunately don't have a, a good picture of, of my own, but it's the split cord malformation. And usually there's a bony spur going through the, the middle here. Um, uh, my best example, unfortunately, is a non-operative uh, patient who I met when she was uh, older. Um, and you can see here um, the abnormality in the back with uh, the spur going through the, the two cords on, on the MRI. So, you know, we talk about tethered cord, um, obviously in an infant, um, I said, that's the type of thing when you're doing prophylactically, but especially when they're older, you really have to think of it more of a, as a clinical diagnosis than an imaging diagnosis, because a lot of these disorders, lipomyelos, even going back to, to myelomeningocele, the imaging's always gonna look tethered. Um, you know, you may see changes or maybe they develop a new syrinx, but I, in, in most cases, I don't know, we always get the scan to make sure, but it, it's not always clear that it's, it's that helpful. Um, and I think you really are treating for symptoms. Um, and there have to be symptoms that are enough to warrant the risk of especially a, a redo untethering. And I think Mari will talk a little bit about treatment and alternatives, but the back pain tends to be the thing that's going to be most likely to improve. So if patients are really limited by back pain, um, you know, that's something to think about. Motor loss and bladder are next, and then sensory changes and scoliosis probably aren't um, primary reasons to do it because the likelihood of success is a lot lower. You know, and I think it is one of these okay. things that's really, 
important. You know, I talked about my biases before, um, but you really have to apply things specifically. So I showed that image before um, of the diastem. This is a patient that was adopted from China. She had a quote back surgery at a couple of months of age. They didn't really have much in the way of records. Um, she's currently neurologically intact. So she's, she has no deficits. She's been evaluated by neurology and, and she's a reasonable um, young girl who can kind of tell you when she has any symptoms. So I think once you've reached that point, you know, in my practice, I think, you know, if you educate them about letting you know if there's issues, then I think those are the patients that, you know, they may be worse off if we did something. And so, you know, I inherited this patient from one of my um, uh, predecessors. And you can see in 2013, this was her image. And you can see over time, with no treatment, her syrinx has actually gotten smaller over time. And she's, um, you know, she's um, getting close to, to graduating from, from high school. So I think within developing your own feeling about these things, you always have to think about each patient individually. And then to kind of segue into um, one of the other controversial topics, you know, they both have the word occult, um, but spina bifida occulta versus occult tethered cord. So obviously spina bifida occulta is what, what I've been going through and highlighting, and it's really a skin covered spinal dysraphism. Um, it can be diagnosed on imaging. There's imaging findings to, to, go, um, to go with it. And there is some name confusion as I alluded to with, with spina bifida, but it's not really controversial as, as an entity and in terms of treatment. Um, I think it's important to distinguish spina bifida occulta from occult tethered cord, which is um, treatment or discussion of treatment in patients with symptoms of tethering in the absence of radiographic evidence that there is tethering. Um, you know, there is some controversy about whether this is a true entity, um, although there, there are people who, who feel very strongly, again, that, that you can um, help these patients. And I just wanted to give um, uh, one additional case and then um, cede some time to my colleagues. Um, but so occult tethered cord syndrome, this is a young female I saw who had a long-standing history of neurogenic bladder and frequent UTIs, had an extensive urology and GI workup. And really the only thing they found was a small bladder. Um, she had chronic constipation, back pain. Um, she was scheduled for a tethered cord operation um, via telemedicine. Um, out of state and, and had just come to me for, for a second opinion. Um, I didn't think her imaging was that good. Um, and so we went through kind of the full Monty workup, um, including um, uh, supine and prone MRIs. I think, you know, prone MRIs are another thing. Um, I got it in this case. It's, it's hard to know how to interpret it. There's some literature about what should or should not happen. Um, and so these are different techniques that we can try, but even with a prone MRI, didn't find any evidence that suggested any kind of tethering. And, and again, with my bias, that was something that uh, meant for me, I wouldn't, wouldn't operate. Um, you can see here, no evidence of fat, conus looks normal. Um, and so I, I said that I would not recommend surgery. Um, so they went and had surgery elsewhere. And I got a note in my, my chart from one of my colleagues um, that they had been seen for evaluation of CSF leak about a year later with complaints of positional headache, but no improvement on bowel or bladder function. Um, so I think these are the things that, that we just have to kind of think about. Um, you know, some patients may improve, but, but it's clear that some don't. And even though we think these are low risk procedures, sometimes things can happen. So when we come to spina bifida occulta, I would say kind of the controversies and things to think about for your own practice are number one, if to treat. So is it something that you think requires treatment? Um, uh, if, if it does require treatment, when to treat? Are you gonna treat early before they're symptomatic or wait till they develop symptoms? And lastly, what's your surgical technique and how are you gonna treat it? Um, I think we'll, you know, we have the, the standard kind of untethering procedures, and then Mari's going to talk about, um, you know, other, another way as, as well. And I'll stop there, open for questions, and then leave some time for the other, other talks.
Okay, thank you, Eric. And can you unshare your screen while we open it up for questions and discussion? That was a really nice uh, presentation. And it was interesting, that last case we showed showed some of the, uh, the problems that we have in this field. The language is somewhat confusing. And a lot of this is the clinical judgment uh, because that was a case where the imaging uh, didn't really look bad, yet the patient had a neurogenic bladder and you had recommended probably correctly not to do surgery. Um, but there are some people, even senior experienced, uh, recognized people who would operate in a situation like that. So of the uh, people in the audience or on the panel, anybody have any experience with that? If you had someone with a neurogenic bladder and imaging that uh, looked normal, but no other cause, would you operate or not? Do they want to tackle that? Okay. Quiet. No, nobody else is speaking up, but that specific situation, I'd also manage conservatively with, with normal imaging, normal conus position, no fatty phylum and a neurogenic bladder. I, I would not do a detethering procedure. I think many people would agree, but there are some senior people, uh, some out of Chicago who have uh, done this surgery and, and reported that there had been improvement. But it is, it is a nuance and I think clinical judgment for people, particularly I see a number of fellows here uh, who are out there, a lot of this is clinical judgment. Um, now- um, Al, there are a couple questions in the chat. Looking right now, um, Laila Mohammed has asked uh, the timing for a newborn with an open dermal sinus tract that has an intradural finding like a lipoma. Does that change uh, Dr. Jackson, your timing of it? Yeah, I mean, I think if it's clearly leaking and open, then they are going to be at a little bit more of an infectious risk. So I don't know that I'd do it emergently, but I'd probably do it before the, uh, you know, in the, in the first, first couple of months kind of pushes you forward a little bit, especially a lot of times though, honestly, I don't know that, and, and others can comment. I don't know that I've ever actually seen the open dermal sinus tracts leaking. I've seen more patients who present later with multiple bouts of meningitis. Um, and, and so I'm not sure I've actually had one that fit that, that I treated, but I think if I knew it was open, I'd probably treat it sooner. Um, but I don't know if anyone has actually had patients that it was identified without meningitis. Anyone in the participants want to comment about the management of dermal sinus with the cultus rapism? Just, hi, John Ruge. Chicago, uh, had a patient a few weeks ago with a, a midline hemangioma, upper lumbar, and uh, a little, it felt a little firm in the midline. The mom uh, took the child, we were going to image, and uh, called the next day, said there's a little bit of something draining out of it, and ca captured it. It was a little bit of like purulent or pus, um, and it was a dermal sinus tract. So there was a little drainage in that infant that the mother noted. No spinal fluid. What was the timing of when you did the case? Well, then, I, you know, we operated. I operated on her. And I, as far as timing for this, I, I, I tend to operate a little earlier than, than, than you do, Eric. Uh, sometimes more practically because uh, I like to keep the kids fairly horizontal. When you get past six months, I don't have to battle the sitting and and, and standing along things. So I, I usually operate in the th sort of the three month, three to six month range. Laura Prolo wants to know how much you rely on urodynamics. I think that's an important topic. Want to I think if, if there are findings and it's hugely helpful, um, I think most of the time, especially in infants, um, you know, you send it for urodynamics and it's fairly rare that they, they have much to say that's helpful. Um, but, you know, if, if they do have a finding, then, then I think that clearly is, is useful. I know I've never actually had it in practice. I know some places do, will also do things like rectal manometry for constipation. Um, I see Greg shaking his head. I think that's a personal thing, but um, the, uh, but I've never, um, I've never had that. And that Layla is asking now again, how do you follow patients uh, with imaging if they have a borderline low conus or do you follow them with imaging? Um, 
I mean, I think you take if if there's things like questionable syrinx or other findings like that, then then maybe I think if it's just a borderline low conus and no tethering lesion, I would probably just tell them what kind of symptoms to look for. I don't know that I would routinely image and follow with imaging, um, but I think it really just uh, depends on the whole picture and if there are other is there a fatty phylum? Are there other things that kind of go along with it? Okay, anybody else in the group of participants want to make a comment or ask a question? We've got an experienced panel here, but experienced group of participants. I think Dr. Page must be the senior person here uh, who's in the audience. Has the field changed any over the past decades, Dr. Page? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've kept up with it. I just got the announcement of this meeting. I thought I'd check in and see what the, the latest stuff is. The only thing that I, I would recall a case that I did years ago, a 35-year-old man who uh, had very minimal symptoms, but he had a clearly tethered cord. And... Uh, we untethered it and uh, it, because he had uh, lost some strength in his, in his legs and he was a hunter and he couldn't uh, get out and do the, his usual uh, hunting in the forest. He was from Kentucky. He came down to Miami uh, to see me about it. And uh, anyway, he had a great result. He was back hunting in no time. Uh, that's, uh, of course, most of these are, are, are uh, you know, you see these in the pediatric great age group for the most part, but uh, this was an unusual one for me. Well, my partner, Dr. Groves, is texting me to say that she's happy to see that things have not changed appreciably in decades here, but uh, we'll continue now uh, with another talk. And this is from our star uh, resident, Brendan Judy here, a budding pediatric nurse. He's a senior resident here at Johns Hopkins. And he's going to talk about uh, this with uh, cloacal extricate. And can you uh, maximize your screen there? Okay. What we'll do is we'll have a series of three talks, each about five minutes long, and then a time for questions and discussion after each. Take it away, Brendan. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. Can you hear me and see my slides okay? Loud and clear. Yep. So thanks for having me uh, speak. Um, so spinal dysrhythm and epispadias extrafy complex is what I'm gonna be speaking about. Um, so this was a case um, that presented to us recently, 21 month old boy from Canada. He was referred to us from the urology department uh, for her tethered spinal cord. He had a past medical history of um, OEIS syndrome or um, phallocele extrafy imperfect anus and spinal defect, which you can see uh, the figure on the right there, which is also known as cloacal extrafy or the mermaid malformation. He had short bowel syndrome, syndrome and he was dependent on a G-tube. He previously had already undergone a colostomy. His um, hemibladders were joined and he had his umphalocele repaired. So the imaging uh, you can see here on the MRI demonstrates uh, the tethered spinal cord ending in a terminal lipoma. Uh, he also had a thoracic kyphotic deformity uh, and there was nothing significant on his uh, cranial imaging. So when we saw him, you know, he was awake, he was smiling, he was sitting in a stroller, no issues with cranial nerves, uh, upper extremities were fine, uh, his lower extremities uh, were, you know, he was weak in the feet, uh, really minimal movement, and he had brisk lower extremities. So the question, you know, so some of the things that are brought up for us is, you know, he needs a spinal cord detethering, but he also needs a bladder extra feet closure. Uh, the, the hemibladders were joined, but he had an under, he had not undergone final closure. He needed iliac osteotomies by the orthopedic surgery team to reconstruct his pelvis because with these patients, their pelvis is all often rotated outward. He needs to repair his pubic diastasis. And, you know, he would likely require an external fixator for the pelvis. So the question that the urology team really asked us was, you know, 
which surgery should go first? Do you think you should detether the, the spinal cord uh, now or later? So some of the things that we talked about with the urology team, the orthopedic team, uh, the general surgery team was timing. Uh, and one of the big things was what, what's more urgent, the extrafy, uh, the abdominal closure, uh, or the detethering. Additionally, what's the positioning going to be, you know, for a lot of their, most of their surgeries, the patient will be um, supine versus ours will be prone. Um, and also, you know, the effects on wound healing after the, the surgeries. And, uh, you know, will that delay other surgeries if the patient needs to remain uh, supine? Uh, additionally, you know, because of the, the involvement of the bladder, you know, one question that was discussed is, will our procedure uh, have an effect on, you know, the patient's tenuous bladder? And does that need to be taken into account? So ultimately, uh, we decided to proceed with the, the laminectomy for the spinal cord detethering first. Um, some of the thought process being that, you know, the, the extra fee was not life threatening at that moment. And if he underwent the, uh, the other surgeries that I mentioned that would delay his, his detethering and, you know, he might benefit from this being done first. So we did the detethering first and then allowed him to heal. Six months later, he underwent surgery with the urology team, the orthopedic team and the general surgery team. So this is something that, you know, Dr. Cohen, our, our moderator, has written about. Uh, this is one of his, an earlier report of cloacal extrophy and occult spinal dysraphism. He reported five patients. Four had uh, myelocystoceles, with, which, you know, Dr. Jackson showed pictures of, and one had a lipomyelomeningocele. So um, cloacal extrophy or, uh, or OAS belongs to a a broader category of EEC or this epispadias extrafy complex, um, which is a, again a disorder of gastrulation and neurulation. And there's you know known man neurologic manifestations of this, which include include spinal dysphagia, but specifically within there, you know, more commonly is the spina bifida occulta, and less commonly myelomeningocele within spina bifida occulta, as I mentioned, Dr. Cohen mentioned in his paper. Um, lipomyelomeningocele and myelocytocele are most common. Um, although in a lot of these patients with hemivertebrae and scoliosis because the, the neural elements don't fully form. So this was a recent paper published in JNS Peds uh, from London, the Great, Great Ormond Street Hospital. So they looked at their patients over the past 20 years. They had 33 patients with uh, cloacal extrafy and spinal dysraphism. Same as kind of has been documented before is they all had closed defects with 20 lipomas, 11 terminal myelocystoceles, which you can see one of the myelocystoceles on the right here. And, you know, part of their, their paper was to look at different patterns because this is really a, a difficult um, dysraphism to categorize. And they talk about different ways to categorize based on previous uh, work by uh, Dr. Pang and Dr. Uh, Chapman. So this kind of prompted us to look at our population uh, with the urology department, um, a database going back to the 1960s. So we've had uh, 1,400 patients with extra fee, different types, uh, bladder versus cloacal invariants. And 8% in of these uh, we found have had some, some type of dysraphism. And the most common being within um, Cloacal extrafy, about you know 98% of those patients or 94 patients ultimately have um, spinal dysraphism. So, um, you know, spinal dysraphism, dysraphism is known to be associated with this, this complex. Uh, and within that complex, cloacal extrafy is kind of the most well documented. I think a big take home point here is that the multidisciplinary decision making is key. You know, certainly if the if the extra fee is life-threatening, that needs to be sorted out first. Um, and really further research, which we're hoping to contribute to, uh, is warranted to characterize the different patterns of dysraphism um, and then the surgical management of, of these dysraphisms in the presence of you know, the issues with the bladder and um, the, the pelvis. So that's all I got. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, you know, any questions? Thanks, Brandon. And can you unshare your screen? Yep. And thanks for 
mentioning that article that I wrote back in the 90s. Uh, that was the time when my partner, Dr. Jackson, I think was still in diapers. Uh, but I mentioned that to say that I think that field hasn't changed all that much. Uh, the, the most common finding that I had in my series was a terminal myelocystic seal, the same as in with your uh, more recent one. And that's an unusual malformation uh, because there's a, uh, there's a low conus with uh, a, uh, a syrinx, uh, uh, an appendable line syrinx, and a conus that passes through an arachnoid line uh, meningocele into a sac outside the body, fluid filled in line with fat and skin. Uh, that, that sac is covered in, with ependema. Uh, and I think it has to do with uh, the uh, relationship we, uh, in the formation of the anterior abdominal wall and the notochord pulling away from the neural tube because the same cells in the embryo that form uh, the anterior abdominal wall in the gut and the bladder uh, form the spinal cord. And so that's a characteristic finding. And I think it's a variant of a lipomyelomeningocele. And uh, two other comments. I, I think the important point you made in that case is it's not a one size fits all uh, disorder, this cloacal extrophy with uh, skin covered dysraphism because it wasn't until the 1960s that these kids began to survive. This was a fatal disease because of fluid and electrolyte problems. So sometimes that dictates a repair earlier of the abdominal wall. And the other thing is that there are ethical considerations in that population. Uh, in, in my group, most of them were boys and uh, because of the abdominal wall problem with hemibladders and a, a cloacal uh, extrophy, uh, they also have genital abnormalities. And, uh, the boys tend to have a, um, a bifid scrotum and a duplex microphallus to the point where uh, a number of them have undergone gender reassignment because of that. So it's a complex field. And, uh, uh, but the, the point being though, as it, with many of these, these kids can be neurologically normal. It's a devastating uh, problem to try to fix, but if they can survive, they can be neurologically normal. So with that, I open it up to the group Anybody have any comments or questions about cloacal extrophy? Uh, I would just add, I think Brenda did a nice job. This, this talk um, or this research project came out of the fact that this patient had been seen at two sites and one had recommended fixing detethering first and another had said to, to do it after. Um, I, and that's part of the reason why we're looking at the series to see if we can actually come up with any data that that's useful to 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 say anything. Um, but I think in in discussing with the urologist and, and our group who does a lot of it, they just thought um, that it made sense to to untether first. I think it's also interesting that two rare conditions occurring in the same patient can tell us something about the pathophysiology that it is still uh, somewhat unclear. Other comments or questions from our illustrious panel? Well, Brenda, thanks. Beautiful job. And now we're going to turn to our colleagues at, at uh, CHOP. And we we're fortunate to have a really good relationship with CHOP. And we have uh, their uh, fellow, Tracy Flanders, who's going to talk about lipomyelomeningocele. And I can see in the audience, we have Jay Storm and Greg Hoyer, her mentors. So uh, I'll turn it over to Tracy at this point. Okay, great. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see. If, okay, so we have a... Sorry, I'm just trying to move this... Three-year-old female seen in a neurosurgery clinic, her fatty mass noted on her lower back. She's from the Middle East. She flew to CHOP for further care. She has no issues with running or walking, no back or leg pain. Um, parents report intermittent constipation and no real bladder issues. So this is the fatty mass that's seen on her lower back here. And this is a lateral view of it. Um, and I have here T1 MR, sagittal and axial views. Oops, sorry. And then the T2 sagittal axials here, just to give you a better idea of what we're dealing with. Okay. 
Um, so this is a patient with a lipomyelomeningocele um, and just a brief overview for people in the audience. Um, lipomyelomeningocele occur in one in 4,000 live births. There is a female preponderance and this is a disjunction error that occurs in secondary neurulation. In disjunction, the neural ectoderm separates from the cutaneous ectoderm. And with premature disjunction, the dorsal cleft remains, the paraaxial mesenchyma then is able to access the neural tube and prevent full closure, which then induces the totipotent mesenchymal cells to differentiate into adipocytes. So it's important to kind of understand this patho pathogenesis in embryology to really understand how to tackle this surgically. So the um, well-known Chapman classification for lipomyelomeningoceles are listed here. Dorsal lipomyelomeningoceles are when the mass is attached to the dorsal part of the conus, shown here on the left-hand side. Um, the thought is that there's no neural tissue within the lipoma. For caudal or terminal, the lipoma is attached to the terminal end of the conus with neural tissue thought to be within the lipoma, and it's relatively difficult for a complete removal of the lipoma um, without damaging the neural tissues. Transitional can be thought of kind of as an in-between um, or thought of as a subtype of dorsal where the lipoma starts from the conus and extends to the phylum and has a worse prognosis. And then in 2009, Pang um, described a cha chaotic lipomyelomeningocele with a prominent ventral component. And it's thought that there's a haphazard distribution of the um, dorsal root entry zone with nerve roots and um, poor placo lipoma interface. And this is very, very difficult to resect. Um, so the thinking about when to operate on these surgically um, with symptomatic patients, the earlier the intervention, the better the prognosis, and most commonly, they present with urologic dysfunction prior to motor or sensory issues. The controversy occurs with asymptomatic patients, so there's the conservative approach where operating might cause more uh, neurologic dysfunction or also predispose the patient to urologic issues. Patients with lipomyelomeningocele are predisposed to UTIs, hydronephrosis, straight cathing, ves vesicourethral reflex. Um, and then the surgical approach is thought that um, it can prevent pro the progressive neurologic, urologic, and orthopedic dysfunction that can occur in asymptomatic lipomyelomeningocele. And given the current advancements in anesthesia, electrophysiology, and periop care, it's thought that this is a safe and effective mode of treatment for my lipomyelomeningocele patients who are asymptomatic. Essentially, progressive neurourological compromise is a rule rather than exce an exception. So there is what is thought of as an inevit inevitability of deterioration. Patients that are asymptomatic in early childhood um, have an almost certain um, progression towards tethered cord syndrome, which often leads to symptoms that may be difficult to treat at a later stage when symptoms have really progressed. So the surgical technique, I'll just um, go quickly through. There's usually um, an elliptical skin incision around the mass along the vertical axis, and then dissect out the suprafascial plane, care taken not to violate the mass and use monopolar cauterization on cut rather than coag. Dissect around the lipoma, identify the fascial ring and the stem of the lipoma, which there may not be one in a terminal lipomyelomeningocele. Identify and just dissect normal lamina superior to the defect. Again, the muscle insertion here might be asymmetric if the fat inserts from one side and the fat may be incomplete on one side. So it's important to look at the MR and identify that dissect the bone edges laterally, dissect and remove the suprafascial lipomatous component, and then use a Lexel just to find the normal dura. Midline durotomy using the normal technique, tent up the dura, um, and we use um, the Lawton Elite scissors to dissect the dura laterally along the mass. And the goal here is to look for the lateral nerve roots. The cord and the nerve roots might be pulled out and the cord might also be rotated, which will distort the lateral line. And the fat can be located often caudally or within the nerves. Um, there might also be a dilated end of the cord like in a lipomyelocystocele. So again, this is where it's important to look at the preoperative MRI. And then we use the scissors and microinstruments to dissect off the nerve roots, identify the placo lipoma interface, identify a tethered phylum if it's present and release it. And we can use intraoperative neuromonitoring in the stimulator to identify any nerve roots that are safe to release to figure out if it's a nerve root or scar. Sometimes a microscope can be a useful adjunct. Um, sometimes the CO2 laser can also shrink down the lipoma, um, but you should only use this when you've really clearly established normal anatomy and the boundaries are clear. You may need to extend the laminectomy superiorly, follow the fat. Um, and we use 6 proline to re or decrease the size of the lipoma. It also decreases the surface area and chances of retethering. 
Um, and then if there's any monitoring changes, you have to release the 6 proline's. We use saprofilm just to create a plain if and when you have to come back. Um, and we sew in a watertight synthesel dural patch. This is also, also thought to reduce the rate of tethering because you want CSF around the cord. Irrigate with vancomycin and one liter of beta dyne irrigation. We use adherus, which is kind of like a tisseal or a duraceal. And then um, we leave a suprafascial drain and we have plastic surgery help us with the closure. There are some people that advocate for lumbar drains or subfascial drains. So the goals of the surgery are really to untether the spinal cord from the lipoma, the phylum, or both, remove the mass because it's thought to prevent retethering and relieve direct compression. You wanna decrease the size of the mass for cosmetic reasons and reconstruct the dural canal to prevent CSF leaks and allow room for the neural elements. This is an intraoperative photo. Here you see the lipoma. This is the fascial ring that it connects to. Here, the lipoma has been truncated. The fascia and muscle are dissected off laterally. laterally. Here again is the lipoma. You can see the dural connection now, and here's the exposed dura superiorly. Um, this is actually just a different patient um, because I forgot to take a picture of the 6-0 proline that we use to get the lipoma mass down. So the, the CO2 laser, it's a fiber-mediated CO2 laser, it shrinks and vaporizes the fat tissue. The intraoperative neuromonitoring, we have somatosensory evoked potentials, motor evoked potentials. We run stimulated and free run electromyograms, and you have to use TIVA just to make sure that um, you can do monitoring throughout the case. Post-operative care is standardized here at CHOP. So we have the patients lay flat 48 hours. Um, we say flat-ish and the parents can hold because the main goal is to keep them calm for 48 hours. The suprafascial JP stays in until they're fully mobilized. Foley stays in three days. We do ANCEF followed by Bactrim until follow-up or whatever preoperative UTI prophylaxis they're on. And we use silver meplux dressing for three days. And then we do wound washes BID once the dressing comes off. The typical length of stays around seven to 14 days. So about 10 to 30% of patients will have uh, complications, CSF leak, neurological deterioration from nerve injury, subsequent tethered cord, incomplete wound healing or breakdown infection meningitis. 10 to 20% of patients will have spinal cord retethering generally within three to eight years after the initial surgery. And those were all my slides. That was a great talk, Tracy. And uh, those were beautiful pictures. I, I suspect that uh, Greg Hoyer probably photoshopped out some of the blood uh, those uh, operative images, but um, it's a different animal um, from the tight phylum, the fatty phylum, and uh, and um, those were great uh, cases. But what about uh, the group either at your place, shop, or in the panelists? Is there anybody? Uh, what type of complex lipomyeloma meningocele that would you manage non-operative? How about a complex transitional lipoma with a lot of roots in it in a kid who's asymptomatic? Is there anybody who would manage that non-operatively? Too much. I, I wouldn't. Uh, this is Greg. Um, uh, I, I think the difference in management can be regional. So I think my colleagues over in London, when I've gone to meetings, um, are a little bit more um, wait and see approach. Um, and here in the States, we tend to, to operate on these. I think Dr. Kanev, who's now a CHOP, and, and yourself, um, back when Dr. Jackson and I were, were tearing up the hockey circuit, um, uh, published some pretty clear data that you know, letting that urologic dysfunction develop um, or not doing anything and then waiting to see how their uro urology is, um, those people do worse. Yeah, I think and one of the important things I think in this webinar is to see that, as you mentioned, the management of these is different in different institutions that a lot of places in Europe will be extremely conservative where we would do something different here. So I think the final word's not in. Uh, anyone else uh, have any comments or questions? Layla uh, again asks a question: Which group would you use neuromonitoring? So I use we use neuromonitoring. Everybody in the states uses neuromonitoring on all these cases. It makes you a more aggressive surgeon, allows you to 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 know you know that the patient's doing well. But you have to have a neuromonitoring tube that knows what they're doing. I think she may have been the person that asked about urodynamics. Um, I don't tend to get urodynamics on patients. Let's say I see them before they're born and then I do this surgery at three months. Um, I tend to use the urodynamics um, for retethering um, more so, um, you know, to tell me that I see a, a change in their urodynamics. And in those cases, I think you really need to have a urology team that is used to looking at tethered cords 
and used to following that same patient um, to find sort of the subtle problems that you can see with your dynamic changes in tethering that you don't, that aren't, that are real or aren't real. So. Yeah, and I agree with Greg. I'm kind of old school, but uh, for a new presentation of an asymptomatic tethered cord, I don't routinely use your dynamics. Other questions or comments from, from the group? So we seem to be on time. And uh, right now we have our final presentation, the recurrent tethering. Uh, and this is from my partner, Mari Groves. Mari is a Hopkins through and through. She did a residency and fellowship here. And she also did a fellowship in spine deformity at the Shriners. She's a force of nature. Don't get on her wrong side, but uh, here for batting cleanup, Mari Groves. All right, guys. <clears throat> well, I have um, a bunch of slides and I wanna kind of get to the videos at the end. So I'm gonna fly through the beginning, um, hopefully. Um, so, this is a 20 year old with a history of some spine surgery, right? Very nebulous at one year of age or so. He presents with this question of worsening urinary incontinence, perhaps some worsening bowel incontinence. But on exam, he actually has real weakness. There's also some new interning of his foot that, oh, yeah, he just forgot to mention. Um, he has bad sensation at baseline, but it may be getting worse. And also, this is leading to a slight change in gait overall. The imaging, which he's never had previously, right? So we have nothing to compare to, really shows this lesion like has been described with a fairly large syrinx and maybe some questionable fat at the bottom. Um, and so I think some of the things to think about at this particular junction, right, are what if any surgeries these patients have had. Some patients will come to you with no surgeries versus multiple prior surgeries. If they have had prior surgeries, what has been the success with that? And then just like we've been talking about with your dynamic studies, are there any other adjunctive tests that you would offer? And I would actually agree with Greg as well. I think the UDS study is sometimes really helpful to monitor and follow patients, especially that have malignant recurrent tethering symptoms. Um, so we took this patient to surgery. It was relatively uncomplicated. There was a fair bit more fat there than you know had been anticipated, but we were able to turn that in kind of using a lot of the same techniques that Tracy just discussed. Um, and he did really well with actual improvement in his neurologic function, improvement in the bowel uh, dysfunction, um, and was pretty happy. But returned about two years lady, later with recurrent symptoms and worsening gait. And so at that time, you know, just has been described, I always talk to my patients about the fact that tethered cord for me, at least is a clinical diagnosis. And so, as you can see, right, of course there's tethering, of course there's pull of the spinal cord, but this is kind of what it looked like immediately after surgery as well, albeit with a little bit more pull backwards. Um, he definitely has a little bit of a fatty mass there, but you know, what are we gonna do with that, you know, without any concurrent symptoms. And I think it's really the concurrent symptoms that led us to consider you know, doing something else or considering something different. Um, and when you think about the operative approaches, I think there have been a lot that's been discussed so far, but certainly there's some pathologic conditions that make it uh, potentially more dangerous, right? And a higher risk of neurological injury. And so patients with arachnoid adhesion, so maybe patients, for example, with an open myelomeningocele who when you go back in have this malignant kind of arachnoid scarring where you can't really even make out the spinal cord or any of the nerve roots. They've had previous surgery, especially those lipomas as Tracy discussed, um, and some of these other things that might make them an, a less than desirable operative candidate. We know that there are recurrent tethering rates, perhaps as high as 50%, maybe higher than that, but I think it's really hard to know across the board. We know that patients that have recurrent tethering are less successful with recurrent surgeries. It's a technically harder procedure and more likely to cause neurological injury. Um, in addition to that, we know that with the complication rate, that's going to increase as patients get older. And so while the complication rate might be a little bit lower in younger patients, as patients age, we know that that is going to increase across the board. Um, and so one potential option, which I think has been raised by several groups around the area, um, including ours, is, is kind of thinking outside the box, right, to say what other options are on the table. And a, a vertebral column shortening uh, allows us to reduce the overall spinal height by about 20 to 25 millimeters. The thought being that, of course, if you can't release all the fatty mass from down below, that then perhaps by moving those two points of the spine together, you're offloading some of the tension, which leads to the downstream effects of tethering with regards to oxidative changes within the spinal cord and the myelin. We know that the reduction in size or the reduction in the spinal column by about 20 to 25 millimeters reduces the tension similarly to releasing 90% of the neural elements. So that means that you would have to cut 90% of the nerves, the fat, whatever it is that's holding the spinal cord in place down below in order to mobilize the spine and reduce the tension in a comparable fashion. 
Um, and so this is done um, in a series of stepwise uh, fashion. First, of course, we have to do a laminectomy and expose the opening of the spine um, at a slightly higher junction. We typically prefer the thoracolumbar junction because we feel like this is a straighter area of the spine. And so it allows for more even compression across the, the spinal column elements. We wanna make sure that there's a nice wide open laminectomy because dural buckling can certainly be something that we can see in these patients. And so it's important to make sure that we're able to, to identify that uh, across the board. And then I have a video in just a moment, which I'll show, which will highlight this a little bit more. And here you can see, um, you know, we're opening and exposing the spine. Again, this is an area where there hasn't been any previous surgery. Um, we did not take care to reduce any of the blood loss in our case. And <laughs> so certainly EBL um, and operative times are gonna be a little bit longer perhaps than maybe your traditional untethering procedure. Um, I knew Andrew J had done a couple of procedures where he was really limiting this to one above and one below and was finding that maybe perhaps there was some increased junctional risk um, in those particular patients. And so um, kind of as a group, we've uh, elected for the most part to do two above and two below uh, the area in question. Here we're using the ultrasonic bone scalpel, which I think is pretty widely used. I really like it as a tool. It allows for pretty precise um, cuts within the bone um, in a hemo, uh, hemostatic fashion. Once we take off the posterior lamina, we're able then to remove the remainder of the posterior elements. Once that's done, um, you know, that's when you really have to put a temporary rod on because you don't want any slippage or um, movement of the spinal column itself. And, um, and then you start to work kind of on the lateral elements themselves. Um, I really just use a pedicle guide. And of course you wanna look at this um, in your preoperative imaging as well. Um, but overall, you're able to, for the most part, use your pedicle uh, to the disc as roughly 20 to 25 millimeters. Um, and I think that that is a good guide in terms of how to do your shortening. In addition to that, by the time you take off the disc, you really allow for adequate compression um, and uh, bone to bone contact for the arthrodesis that you really want to achieve as well in these patients. Um, you can nav, we certainly don't have to, but I think that's helpful. And then again, the bone scalpel has actually a burr attachment which I think is really great because it's self-irrigating and allows you to take off the anterior uh, portion of the bone pretty smoothly. Um, it's important to remember that you have to take off the rib heads uh, at the particular level that you're working at uh, because otherwise the spine won't really compress um, in a sequential fashion. And so, we, uh, so here we are completing kind of all of the bony elements, making sure to respect the dura. Um, you don't necessarily have to take that nerve root. You really are allowed and are able to work around it pretty easily. Um, and then just finishing the anterior osteotomy here. Once that's done, you can confirm, of course, that the, um, that the area in question or the length in question is appropriate. And then we like to use an adjunct for interoperative ultrasound to allow us to identify and assure that the anterior component of the spine is nicely decompressed and we're not losing anything there. Um, once all of the bony elements are done, then you um, wanna be able to do sequential compression across the bony defect. Um, and that's done here as well. Throughout the whole period, of course, we're monitoring with interoperative monitoring, ensuring that all of that stays constant um, and stable. And you can see although that there's dural buckling here, um, by the time we actually ultrasound and take a look, all of that is actually pretty well and the spinal cord is, is nicely without any tension underneath. And I think that's pretty much it. All right, so that's what we recommended for this guy who really came to us with recurrent symptoms after a short period of time where we knew, I knew that really from a like fomitous standpoint, we weren't going to be able to um, decompress any more of that. I'm gonna pivot. Oof. Um, and overall it's been, has been said, motor and sensory function as well as urological symptoms all do have some improvement and really in our series as well as across the board, um, vertebral column shortening is roughly comparable with not only the untethering procedures, but across the literature as well. Um, I think it's important to remember that for these particular patient populations, there really are no uh, recommendations or guidelines that are offered um, and something that we probably should address as a community. Um, and I think it's also important that anytime you're considering a new technology that really hasn't been tested in the long run, right? I mean, the real data that we have from spinal cord shortening is probably about five to seven years. Um, old. And as a result, you know, we have patients or I see patients um, in our transitional clinic that will present 10, 20, 30 years later with recurrent symptoms, because I do think that the pathophysiology of adult tethered cord is maybe slightly different from that of, of pediatrics. And as a pediatric neurosurgeon, you're often asked to weigh in for a lot of these complex adult uh, pathologies that your adult colleagues may not necessarily, you know, be uh, best suited for. 
And so I would say that if a patient comes to you with a fatty phylum at the age of 20, that your knee jerk response for a procedure is should not be right a spinal shortening, but instead for patients who have had maybe recurrent symptoms or new symptoms um, in a delayed fashion after improvement uh, from the previous untethering, that perhaps those are patients that might benefit the most from this. As a community, I also think it's really important that we're very narrow in our focus when making these recommendations and that spinal cord shortening is not something that should be offered just for any patient that presents. Um, because again, there are really unknown long-term consequences and it does require some knowledge and expertise for spinal fusions, um, which may not necessarily be shared you know, by all people involved. All right. Okay. Thanks, Mari. It was a great talk, and I think uh, a real important one because for anybody who has done a re-detethering in an adult patient, it's not fun, particularly a re-re-detethering, uh, and the success rate is lower and the complication rate is higher. So this uh, vertebral column shortening is a real innovation for selected patients. Anybody have any questions or comments from the panel or from the participants? Any other words of wisdom? Dr. Leonard, Dr. Durham, I see you. The limbric. It's a quiet group, it must be. Well, I wanted, I, if, if I could, is if, uh, two questions. Mari, did you, do you let Al hold any of those instruments? Uh, and number two, it, it, these are for, in somebody that does spine surgery and stuff, I, I just, I, I thought this was a perfect way of highlighting an alternative measure when you when you get to these older patients that have two and three um, detethering operations and they're coming back with recurrent back pain and or symptoms suggestive of it's just an alternative way to approach that because these complications when they get it just just are just significant and I, I just I, I just applaud you for what you're doing and and I'm I'm hope, hopefully this this sort of promoted some thought process amongst everybody when. Uh, you know, as, as a different way to approach tethered cords in very select instances. Well, I think it's um, also really important to remember that there are so many different kinds of tethered cord, right, as, as Eric alluded to. And so, again, I don't think we actually know the best patient population. And in fact, these patients with really complex myelomeningocele,s who maybe have had multiple untetherings that we've all taken care of with arachnoiditis that seems to coat the entire nervous system. In those particular patients, I'm not sure, you know, if this is really the answer because perhaps the, the vascular constriction is actually um, the dense arachnoid around the spinal cord itself, right? And not so much a pulling or a tethering of the, of the cord. Um, so I do wanna say that for anyone who's considering this, there's a small group of us who I think do the surgery pretty regularly, who would be happy to talk through like options. Um, and I think it's really important that we're very narrow again in the focus of patients that we would recommend. And I never try to oversell this as a, as a you know, procedural holy grail. There are patients that will come and say, well, why didn't we do this 10 years ago? You know, it's just not the right surgery for everyone all the time. Um, and so to be really thoughtful about that, I think would be important moving forward. Dr. Groves, I just think that uh, the, neat, the neatest thing about what you're doing is um, you're building on what Dr. Cohen and, you know, the, the, the Dr. McClone, the pathophysiology and just attacking the pathophysiology with a different treatment, which is really kind of neat. Um, one thing to think about for people that it, I have these voices in my head. Unfortunately, one of them's Dr. Jackson, <laughs> <Atta> boy. <laughs> one of them's uh, Brendan's dad. Uh, and, and that one's an interesting one. Um, but one is uh, Dr. Sutton and um, uh, the ones that, that I can tell you that he's, that voices in my head that he said, um, is when you're dealing with a myelomeningocele, um, although we're not talking about it today, one of the treatments is to fix the shunt sometimes. Um, and so when you're, you're thinking about myelomeningoceles and tethered cord, and as freaking cool as it is to untether spinal cords, um, you got to think, think about the other parts of the disease, like syrinxes in the, in the carry and the, and always fix the shunt first if it's the shunt, because you'll like a working shunt when you do the tethered cord release anyway, so. Great point, Greg, your gray hair is starting to show. Anybody have any other comments or questions? Well, Mari, thanks, it was a great cutting edge talk, and uh, we're a little beyond our time, but uh, I want to thank 
uh, our invited speaker, Dr. Jackson, and our three great panelists, uh, Brendan, and Tracy, and Mari, and, uh, and for the participants as well, we've got a huge group of uh, powerhouse participants here. Uh, we have almost 50 people here. So thanks again to the section for allowing us to do this webinar, and we'll see you next time. Have a good night.